Welcome back to the series on those 18 days. Today we go to the next day, the sixth day. Now, during the Kurukshetra war, various warriors had claimed that they would be able to overcome the opposite warriors in a very short period. Uh, and they would gain victory not over not only over particular opposite warriors but over the entire opposite army so karana had given an estimate and that to bhishma was such an unrealistically inflated estimate that bhishma had <clears throat> scornfully rejected it and at that time karana feeling insulted and belittled by bhishma retorted that I will not fight as long as as long as Bhishma is the commander because if an army wins the war the commander gets the credit and because Bhishma has refused to give me due uh, recognize my contribution my ability so I do not want to give him credit for the victory that I will bring for Duryodhana Therefore, as long as Bhishma is the commander, I will not fight. Duryodhan was caught in a difficult situation because he knew that Karana was much more devoted to him, faithful to him than was Bhishma. And for fighting, he knew Karana would have a much stronger spirit of fighting against the Pandavas than would Bhishma, who he felt because that was Bhishma was affectionate to the Pandavas and therefore Bhishma might not fight wholeheartedly. At the same time, Bhishma was by far the most expert and most experienced warrior, not just on the Kurukshetra war, but practically on the whole earth. Uh, so therefore, he didn't want to lose Bhishma. He had already appointed Bhishma as the commander of his army. So when Karana refused to fight, he accepted Karana's refusal and then Bhishma fought, uh, leading the Kauravas. Now, on the Pandava side also, Arjuna had made some estimates of how soon he would be able to defeat the opposing army. When the actual war started, it was a seesaw affair. Some one, sometime On the first day, the Kauravas got the upper hand, second day, the Pandavas got the upper hand. And things kept changing. But none of the estimates by any of the warriors turned out to be realistic. The opposition for the Pandavas by the Kauravas and for the Kauravas by the Pandavas turned out to be much stronger than what either side had estimated based on their proclamations. And at one level, in Kshatriya culture, there is a spirit of proclamation for intimidation. The, there, is, there are mind games which are fought. And if, if the opponent is demoralized, then it's much easier to defeat them than if they are if their best morale. So therefore, we, can, we needn't take the initial assessments by either side warriors as as objective evaluations. They could also be uh, contextual proclamations for boosting their morale and for demoralizing their opponents or striking fear in their opponents. The key point which uh, I'm driving toward is that as the war went on, the, it became tougher and tougher. And it soon became clear that how long the war would go on, nobody could say. Who would win was very difficult to say. Although Bhishma had declared that the Kauravas would not win as long as Krishna was on the side of the Pandavas. But that did not mean necessarily that the Pandavas would win. Because the Pandavas also were faced with formidable opposition. And Bhishma had not yet been defeated. Drona had not yet been defeated. And these were the foremost in an array of many other formidable warriors also. So everyone had to reevaluate their estimates. 
and among the all those who had to reevaluate duryodhan had to do the maximum reevaluation duryodhan had arrogantly dismissed krishna's peace proposition uh, by saying that he would not give even as much land as was required to put the tip of a needle through why had he been so arrogant because he had been so confident of course what he thought was confidence turned out to be overconfidence he had thought that with his superior warriors and superior number of forces he would easily crush the pandavas but it turned out that they were far from easily crushing whether with difficulty also whether he would win or not was unclear and yet he kept fighting and leading his army uh, not officially as the commander but uh, but obviously he was the son of the king he was the prince and he was the person who was overall in charge uh, duryodhana himself was a good fighter was you could say even he was a, in some ways a great fighter with respect to the mace and with other weapons also he was a good fighter and for a army few things are as disorienting disturbing as to see their head being defeated now the commander is at one level the functional head of the army the king is the overall head the official head either of them if they are defeated then that can be very demoralizing for the army in fact many times one army might have far superior forces superior in weaponry superior in uh, num uh, superior in number superior in say relative position say one army might be on the higher level and another army on the lower level but if somehow the commander or the king is defeated is arrested or worse still is killed then that can leave the remaining soldiers not just leaderless but also spiritless and then they may all fall like a pack of cards they may run helter skelter in fear or even if they stay and fight they may just be over they may just not have the will to fight and they might be overpowered this can happen even in sports for example when a top batsman who is the lead performer in a team with others also who are good performers the or okay performers not poor but okay but if the top performer suddenly gets out then the whole side may collapse like a set of dominoes so the point which we are driving toward is that the fall of the king can be quite demoralizing for the whole army and if the king falls even if the king is temporarily defeated that is humiliating for the king because the king wants to show, wants to show to the whole army that i am so powerful i am so illustrious that i can defeat everyone uh, and yet if that king becomes defeated and especially if the king is defeated by not such a big warrior on the opposite side then that is even more difficult to bear so the kauravas and the pandavas when they were fighting duryodhan was time and time again thwarted by the kaurava forces we do know that duryodhan was defeated once by bhima and ghatotkacha that was second day and again he was defeated by bhima and on the sixth day he encountered his third defeat at the hands of bhima and that was for for bhima for duryodhan for bhima it was a matter of celebration and for duryodhana it was a matter of shock dismay humiliation mortification agony and when he was defeated thus for the third time he just couldn't comprehend what is happening how can i be defeated like this so in general whenever somebody is proud in the sense of being arrogant then they overestimate themselves and it is said that better to overestimate your enemies than to underestimate them 
because then we will be better prepared but but it is better to underestimate oneself and rather than overestimate oneself because again we will take due caution if we have underestimated ourselves so underestimating oneself doesn't mean disrespecting oneself it doesn't mean uh, not having self confidence it all it just means that confidence is complemented with caution and when we talk about pride the word pride can sometimes have a positive sense of honor that be honorable Mm. So it's our team which has lost all the matches, which has lost the series, may still fight on the say the remaining matches or match, and they may say we are playing for pride. That means we don't want to be whitewashed completely. We don't want to say lose five zero, even if it's three matches lost, still we'll try to play the remaining two matches. That is for pride. So there, the word pride is used in the sense of honor, and uh, those who have a sense of honor, that sense makes them behave honorably. and not uh, given spinelessly or just uh, capitulate just accept abject defeat or surrender so pride if it is used in the sense of honor it is positive it is healthy it inspires one toward honorable actions but pride in the sense of arrogance is unhealthy it makes one leaves one unprepared to face face to face the actual fight and to even accept the reality of defeat after one has been defeated so even when one has been outsmarted or overpowered pride in the sense of arrogance keeps one in denial and it was duryodhan who lived in such denial so his pride was in the form of arrogance and as is the well known saying pride cometh before a fall so whenever there is proud when somebody is proud that means they place themselves at a very high level and they are not deserving of being at that high level and therefore they will be knocked down by the storms of life by the tests of life so we all have a particular level at which we can function well and if we try to go at a level higher than that then we will be overpowered we will be knocked down so when now taking that well known saying pride cometh before a fall i would like to nuance it a little bit when we say that pride is followed by a fall what exactly falls it is actually the proud may fall but their pride doesn't fall or to put it another way they may externally fall from their superior position but that may not and that frequently does not change their internal conception of who they are and where they are meant to be so pride refuses to learn even when life is teaching that lesson very forcefully very graphically in with undeniable force but still one may live in denial that's the blinding potency of pride so duryodhan went through this situation we will talk about duryodhan in the later sessions also but suffice it to say over here that duryodhan's mind was so devilishly contaminated by pride in his own presumed power and position and envy toward the pandavas actual power and position that it completely distorted his perception so when we are proud we don't just look at who we are we imagine who we are going to be or we imagine that we already are better than what we actually are and in any situation pride can actually backfire because if a person who is too proud if they try to lift a if they have the capacity to lift say 30 kg or 40 kg 50 kg weight and if they try to lift 100 kg weight just to show off to others well that would be very dangerous it will crush them so with respect to physical weights we can easily understand that overestimating is going to be injurious but with respect to life's challenges when we then the challenges are not so easily mathematically measurable then we may not understand that we are overestimating ourselves so 
so Duryodhana's mind always found an excuse to justify everything that he did wrong and it tried to give a positive spin even to times when his wrong actions led to terribly wrong results but he he continued on perhaps the most graphic incident of this uh, how the proud may fall but the but the pride inside them does not fall and that comes in the in the section of the mahabharat when the pandavas are in the in the forest so although Duryodhan has exiled the Pandavas, dispossessed them of all their wealth, still he is not satisfied. Now envy gets doesn't get joy in one's own position. Envy gets joy only in seeing the misery of one's objects of envy. So he decided to go to the forest to flaunt his wealth and his power in front of the Kauravas, in front of the Pandavas, who he knew were living in great austerity and poverty in the forest. But while he was trying to flaunt his power, he provoked the Gandharvas and they defeated and arrested Duryodhana right in front of his, his soldiers and his, the royal ladies, all, in, all of whom he had been trying to impress uh, by marching against the Pandavas. So Duryodhana felt so humiliated by this defeat that he could hardly control himself and then when Bhima and Arjuna came at the request of Yudhishthira and freed him, his humiliation knew no bounds. He grudgingly thanked them but not to, to be at the mercy of those whom one was planning to subordinate and crush and actually show no mercy, that was unbearable turning of the tables for Duryodhan. And he felt so mortified that he wanted to commit suicide. He told Dushasan to take up the throne on his behalf uh, and become the heir for his father. And he decided to fast till death. But if someone doesn't have that inner detachment, if one still has that obstinate desire to want to enjoy, then nothing can help them actually. No matter what they do, they are, the illusion will continue and they will find some reason to justify their illusion. So while Duryodhana was fasting to death, he was proud and he had fallen terribly. But at that time, he had a mystical vision. Later, he was not even sure whether that we, it was an actual mystical vision or it was just a hallucination. But either way, he saw in that uh, during that experience that he had been taken in a subtle form to the Daityas and Dhanavas who told him that you are our representative and if you fight on our behalf, you lead an army, we will enter into the bodies of your soldiers, your generals. And we have a plan to destroy the Pandavas and to destroy the gods who are manifesting as the Pandavas, who are supporting, who are supporting the Pandavas. So through this vision, Duryodhana felt that this was not just a territorial battle on the terrestrial or earthly plane. He realized that this was a cosmic battle between forces far beyond the human both celestial and subterranean, both heavenly and uh, both divine and demoniac forces. So he, that boosted his morale and he came back to fight. He said, I will strengthen myself, I will strengthen my army and I will fight again. But despite all his preparation, again Duryodhana's whole army was defeated single-handedly by Arjuna at Virat. So time and time again, Duryodhana was knocked down from the high pedestal which he had constructed for himself. But again he climbed upon that pedestal and still kept claiming the position and power which he didn't have. And that is now happening again and again in this war, the third time when it happened. And yet he maintained his obstinate determination. 
he thought that how was i able to exile the pandavas how was i able to put them to so much misery if if i didn't have the power to do so if i didn't have the brains to do so if um, destiny were against me then i would not have had the successes that i've had till now therefore this is just a bad phase and i will win and that's how he stubbornly continued on so the point is that pride may be felt ex- the proud may be felt externally but pride has to be felt internally a person has to consciously take the decision that being being arrogant doesn't work for me it only makes my life miserable more and more and it sets me up for more and more falls therefore i will give up a pretense of being more powerful than what i am and i will live according to my actual capacities so unless there is that inner change in one self conception in one self understanding without that inner change no amount of outer upheavals will bring about a change a person may may be taught a lesson a hard way but even then they will not learn it as it is said a person convinced against their will those convinced against their will are of the same opinion state So although Duryodhana was defeated third time within six days, still he arrogantly persevered, thinking that he would be victorious soon. Such is the illusion caused by pride in the form of arrogance. Thank you, Ray Krishna.